Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Dr. Jockers Functional Nutrition Podcast. We've got a great guest today, Dr. Ken Berry. He's well-known on social media, has uh, over a million YouTube subscribers, uh, big social media following, and he's huge on keto, low-carb diet. Uh, you know, obviously, if you've been listening to this channel at any for any length of time, you know that I am as well. This is a, a sort of nutrition plan that I personally follow, my family follows, and that we recommend for our clients as well. And, and Dr. Barry is a board certified family physician, a fellow in the American Academy of Family Physicians, he practiced family medicine in rural Tennessee for 20 years. And he's seen over 20,000 patients in his career. So a lot of clinical experience here. You can find him at drberry.com. And he has a great book called Lies My Doctor Told Me. So really catchy title there. And we're gonna talk about that in this interview. So Dr. Barry, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Doc. It's a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I like most people, you know, that are interested in low carbon keto, came across a lot of your videos on YouTube, and you do a great job of really breaking it down and making things simple for people. But how did you get started with this? I mean, when did you come across low carb keto? Let's let's go into your story on that. Yeah. So the reason that I started actually even giving a crap about nutrition because early in my medical career, I didn't give nutrition a thought mm -hmm. at all. I, I believe the old paradigm that, that the human mammal is somehow magical, that you could just feed them whatever kind of crap happened to be on the store shelf. And somehow we magically turn that into lean tissue and, and good, healthy brain. Uh, but a few years into my medical practice, I started to gain weight and my blood sugar started to go up. And at my most unhealthy, I was morbidly obese, six foot three, and I weighed 297 pounds and had become thoroughly pre-diabetic and was well on my way to developing type two diabetes. I did not have an ultrasound or a CT, but I'm sure I had fatty liver because my, my ALT and AST were starting to pescally elevate, just a little, not a lot. And I thought, well, I must be drinking too much alcohol, but I'm sure that if you and I could go back in time and scan my liver, I was already getting some nice marbling in my yeah. liver, which is great for a ribeye, but not that great for the human liver. And so I thought, well, I'm, I'm just eating too much crap. I've got to fix this. And so I went back and studied my old nutrition notes and, you know, checked out what the American Diabetes Association was recommending. And I started, I implemented those things. And I can tell you what I learned in med school about human nutrition and, and actually the care and feeding of a, just a normal human walking the street was to avoid all saturated fat, eat lots of whole grains and jog. Yeah. That was literally, literally everything I was taught in med school about how to, the, to, to feed a human in the wild, so to speak, which is our, our natural environment. Right, right. And so I, I implemented all those things and was really very, very religiously uh, into that. And I gained more weight and it wasn't, it wasn't muscle that I was gaining. And so I thought, you know, I, I obviously don't know anything about human nutrition, but maybe just maybe these experts in air quotes out there, maybe they don't know what they're talking about either. So I really picked my head up out of my little family medicine row and I started looking around and, and very broadly and so I found the the primal blueprint by Mark Sisson I found the the paleo diet by Lauren Cordain and I found a tattered copy of uh, Dr. Dr. Adkins seminal work I got it for 50 cents at a rummage sale mm -hmm. and I read those three books and I'm like well this all sounds nuts but uh, these guys you know look pretty healthy and it seems like a lot of people are getting benefit from this what if the traditional model is just wrong? What if, what if, what if that, what if, what if the Atkins diet is not a fad diet? What if the diet I was taught in medical school and the diet that the ADA and the AHA are recommending, what if those are the fad diets? What if they are just not based? I mean, I don't know. Obviously I've been eating the, what the ADA said to eat and I'm getting fatter and, and getting more diabetic. And so I really took a hard look at my paradigm of just blindly trusting the powers that be and, and started. And then also I started to look in, in even deeply into fields that most doctors never give two thoughts about like uh, archeology span and paleoanthropology. And I started to think, well, you know, humans have been on this planet a long damn time and they, they had to have eating patterns 
patterns that, that we can somehow know about. And turns out we can know very intimately what human beings ate, whether you're talking about 10,000 years ago, 50,000 or 200,000, we can see exactly what percentage of their diet was made up by meat, uh, C3 vegetables, C4 vegetables. We can tell all these things, uh, what percentage of seafood was in their diet. Did they eat carnivores or did they just eat herbivores? We can, we can tell all these things by the stable carbon and, and nitrogen isotope analysis of the bones of the collagen of teeth uh, and definitely of soft tissue if, we, if there's still any available. And so it started to occur to me when you start to look at especially archeology span and paleoanthropology, you stop thinking about 50 years being a long time or you know, 100 years, that's not a long time actually, yeah. it's actually a blink of the eye for the, the full spectrum of human history. And it started to occur to me that this, this diet, this, this plant-based modern Western diet that we're all told to eat, that could absolutely be a fad diet. That's just based on no research. It just became popular for whatever reason. And now, well, you know, anytime your grandmother and your mother both teach you the same thing, that's just, you just assume that that's common sense and that's just a law of human nature. Turns out that's not true at all, and especially when it comes to nutrition. And, and sometimes you, you step on toes doing what you and I do because people are like, so you're basically telling me that my mother was an idiot and that my grandmother was an idiot. I'm like, no, no, my, my mother and grandmother gave me absolutely terrible nut nutrition advice as well. It doesn't mean that their, their intellect was lacking. It just means that they were taught wrongly as well. And indeed, you can see this generational miseducation in many facets of human life. It's not just yeah. nutrition, but the, for me, I think nutrition is the bedrock, the foundation of all human health and all human chronic disease and all human optimization. Without the, the foundation to build your health on, you're, you're gonna fail every time. It may not happen in your teens or 20s when you can live on seemingly junk food and do okay. But now we know as we're starting to check insulin levels and fasting insulin and C-peptides, we know that these young slender teenagers who happen to have terrible acne, they're already hyperinsulinemic from eating this, this diet. Uh, young teenagers who are slender and pure, appear healthy, they're already developing fatty liver and prediabetes. And they're starting to develop PCOS that are all caused by the problems with hyperinsulinemia that this modern fad diet causes. Yeah, so let's talk about insulin and how somebody develops hyperinsulinemia. We've had uh, Dr. Ben Bickman on in the past. Uh, he's, he's explained it very well, but uh, I know you have a very simple way of explaining it too. And so let's go into that. Yeah, so insulin is a very important uh, substance in the human body and yeah. in all mammals for that matter. Uh, and it, it, it does hundreds of things in your body. It doesn't just do one thing. And that's, that's important to know. And, and Dr. Yeah. Bickman, Professor Bickman is an absolute resource and he's, he's a, a, a national treasure. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he should be nominated for a Nobel prize for the work he's doing. I agree. But anytime you feed a mammal, an inappropriate diet, uh, and, and when it comes to humans, that would be a high carbohydrate diet. Anytime you give a human, any human, any age, too many carbohydrates, their blood sugar is going to spike. And yeah, that's yeah. going to make their insulin spike. Because one of the most important jobs that we know of that insulin does is that it tries to keep the blood sugar levels within very tight constraints. If yeah. your blood sugar is too low, you don't feel well and you can't function well. If your blood sugar is too high, you may still feel okay, but you're doing permanent irreparable mm -hmm. damage to every organ in your body. Every tiny arterial that's feeding your eyes, your brain, your heart, your testicles, your ovaries, every single part of you, you're doing damage to those tiny mm -hmm. arterioles. And when they cease being able to supply a good healthy blood supply to that organ, then you start to have disease in the organs themselves. And, and the part of my underlying paradigm for, for every video I make on YouTube, every post I make on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, is that human beings are by design low carbohydrate mammals. If you feed us too many carbohydrates, we will immediately start to get sick, we'll start to suffer, and we will die an early 
unpleasant death. Yeah. Uh, I think the feline model is an excellent example to kind of help people understand this. Felines, whether it's your house cat or uh, a cheetah, cougar, lion in the wild, they are obligate carnivores. And I also like saying this because a lot of people don't know this. They have to have a, an all meat diet or they will absolutely become obese, develop type two diabetes and develop fatty liver, have a terrible coat, they'll suffer, they won't, they won't, be, they won't have any fun and they'll die earlier than they should. Uh, the, the cat food companies don't care about this. They're trying to make a profit. And so they fill up the cat food with grains, pea protein, other plant-based things. And this is absolutely not a feline, a, pro a proper feline diet. And that's why we have epidemics of, of fatty liver, type two diabetes and obesity in our cats in the United States is because we're not feeding them a proper cat diet. The same exact thing happens in human beings. When you feed a human mammal, uh, a high carbohydrate diet for too many days, too many weeks or months in a row, human beings become chronically hyperinsulinemic. They become chronically inflamed, inappropriate inflammation. They start to develop fatty liver, type two diabetes and obesity every time. And, and, and so depending on what your personal fat threshold is, uh, which is determined by your genetics and perhaps your epigenetics as well, some people don't develop peripheral fat. Right. as quickly as other people. Now, I'm Scotch, Irish, lots of German, lots of Nordic descent, and, and 95, uh, more Neanderthal DNA than 97% of the population. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get fat. If you feed me too many mm -hmm. carbohydrates, I'm going to start to blow up like a balloon. Other people, uh, usually people of Asian or Indian descent, they can eat a very high carbohydrate diet. And if you just look at them, they look slender and healthy. But if you check their A1C and check their... Yeah fasting insulin and check their C-peptide, they're already hyperinsulinemic, probably have been since they were a young child. They're developing fatty liver and type 2 diabetes in this body that appears to be slender and healthy. Uh, but it, 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 I think it's going to turn out to be a law of human health. If you feed a human being too many carbohydrates, regardless of what the carbohydrate is, you're going to wind up with an inflamed, hyperinsulinemic, sick human. Uh, and, and I definitely think there are, are less good and less bad carbohydrates that we can choose from. But it's, I think it's the total carbs. And I, I, I really, the more I study this, the, the more I don't think it, it matters where it comes from. If you eat 200 grams a day of, of carbohydrates from broccoli, which would be damn hard to do, you, yeah. That's too many carbohydrates for you. And now it's obviously much easier to get uh, too many carbohydrates from eating jelly donuts. Only takes one or two and you've, yeah. you've maxed out for the day, <laughs> if not the week. But I think the total carbohydrate intake is a, is a marker, a nutritional marker that you can use to predict that person's current health and definitely to predict their future health. Yeah, and I think that the American Dietetic Association – uh, and typical, uh, you know, nutritionists out there are recommending something like what, 300 grams of total carbohydrates daily, somewhere in that range. Anywhere from 150 yeah. grams to 350 plus grams a day, yeah. depending on the person and on how liberal they are with uh, the healthy whole grains. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so where do you like to see the carbohydrate range? I don't think any human needs more than 50 total grams of carbohydrates mm -hmm. a day. Um, now, uh, when when a young child is nursing, they are getting, I mean, that is a what we would consider in the keto community a high carbohydrate diet. There's no doubt mm -hmm. about that. But the, the interplay, the connection between the human baby and its mother is so ancestrally appropriate. You can't even begin to question that. I mean, yeah, we yeah. do, we have, st we've started to see research come in that shows that if the mom's eating a high carb diet, she actually alters the amount of carbohydrates in mm. her milk. It can actually raise them. If she's eating, a, eating or drinking a high fructose diet, she can absolutely force her breast milk to have to be a higher carb, higher fructose containing milk. And so we know now that a mom eating an inappropriate diet, some of that in inappropriateness is filtered out through her biological systems, but not all of it. And so again, it comes back, that's so important what a mom eats before she gets pregnant, while she's pregnant, and while she's breastfeeding. But after a, a human is weaned from the breast, and that can happen anywhere, uh, ancestrally can happen anywhere from two years to seven years in, 
uh, that, and it looks like in different cultures and different times and different um, food uh, um, scenarios, that, can, that, that matters tremendously when you wean the baby. But after that baby's weaned off of the mother's breast milk, that baby would never drink milk again, ever. Yeah. For the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. And then also they would just, they would start eating what the adults in the tribe were eating, which would be lots of fatty meat and some veg if you didn't get, get enough meat. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And and also babies are growing rapidly, doubling in size. And so right. the carbohydrates stimulate insulin and insulin turns on growth patterns in the body. Yep. It tells the body to grow. Yeah. And so, early in my practice, I'd already figured out that that skim milk and low fat milk were yeah. just not, not, well, if you're trying to be lean and healthy, you don't want to drink that. And I used to tell my right. patients, if you want to gain weight and grow as quickly as you possibly can drink lots of milk, because that's what milk's designed for. And I'm talking about the milk of our own species. If you start drinking milk from another species, who knows what kind of inflammation you're going to wind up getting because that milk is made for a very specific DNA and you ain't that. So if you're drinking, you know, and a lot of people get very offended if I say something negatively about raw milk. Uh, I absolutely believe that raw milk is less bad than homogenized Mm -hmm. pasteurized milk, but it's still milk. And what is the purpose of mammalian milk? It is to help a young mammal grow and gain weight as quickly as possible. So it kind of becomes obvious and, and, and common sense if you want to, if you want to bulk up and get fat, drink lots of milk because yeah. that's what it's made for. Uh, but if that's not your goal, then probably you should not drink liquid dairy yeah. after yeah. the age of four to seven years. Yeah, it makes sense. When I was a uh, a skinny athlete in high school, my coach told me drink a gallon of milk, and of course we didn't want the fat, so I was drinking like skim milk or low fat milk every single day. And I did that for years. And then I had, then I, no wonder I developed irritable bowel syndrome when I was 21. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I had terrible acne when I was a teenager. And so in junior high and high school, I wanted to play football. I wanted that to be my career. And so I, I did the same exact thing. I was a milk baby. I drank a gallon of milk every single day. And my grandmother wouldn't buy whole milk because that's bad for you. So I, it was 2% yeah. milk, what I was drinking because my family couldn't stand anything less than 2%. But yeah, every day for, uh, it was a gallon of milk a day and I had terrible acne. I, I would go to the dermatologist. I would try. And so for you, it expressed as irritable bowel. Yep. For me, it expressed as, as just terrible acne. And I try to get that message across to young people. But, you know, when you're a teenager, you're bulletproof. You don't listen to that <laughs> kind of stuff. And I've got videos on my YouTube channel, which are some of my least watched videos about acne being an absolute mm. sign that you're drinking too much low fat yeah. dairy, and that you probably have hyperinsulinemia. But I think the teenagers are they're more interested in watching music videos and cute cuddly kittens than they are of, of trying to think, well, you mean my diet matters about my acne or my irritable bowel or my eczema or psoriasis or whatever? Yeah, totally matters. Yeah, most people think skin issues are have something to do with what you're putting on your skin. And they don't yep. realize that they're actually a reflection of what's going in your body. We have a gut skin axis and we inflame the gut for certain individuals they're going to have more inflammation in their skin. I know for, for myself, like my mom has psoriasis and it really flares up when she eats nightshade vegetables, yep. uh, dairy, right? Dairy is a huge trigger for that. Yep. So yeah, a lot of these types of things. Yeah. And I, this is part of what I call the modern, the modernity fallacy. We think, oh, I have a problem with fill in the blank and it could be your skin, your gut, your joints, your hair, whatever we immediately think, what do I need to add to this system to make this better? Mm-hmm. That's if we have, what yeah. product do I need to buy? What service do I need to purchase? What, what monthly thing do I need to sign up for in order to make this problem better? And it's, it's a very Western thought that, yeah. that you need to buy something to add to your system. And so if it's skin, then we immediately think I need a cream, I need lotion, I need a gel. I need a prescription. I need a, you know, what, what's Jessica Simpson saying is good for skin. I need to buy that and put it on my skin. And that's a, that's just wrong. That's yeah. a, your skin is built of what you've eaten over the last three to six months. And if you have eaten or drank inappropriate things, then your skin, your cell membranes are made of inappropriate fats. Mm-hmm. You're, you've been chronically hyperinsulinemic. Your blood sugar has been spiking all over the place. 
you, you, you've messed up your glycomics uh, on the outer part of your cell uh, membranes. All this stuff is out of whack and there's no pill that's gonna fix that. There's no cream, lotion, gel that's gonna fix that. You've got to fix your diet and then give your, cause your skin cells turn over pretty quickly compared to other cells. Right. And so within three to six months, you would have got you will have gotten rid of all those old cells that were built inappropriately from less than ideal building materials. You will have repopulated your skin with robust, hardy, well-built skin cells that have the right glycomates on the outside, have the right fatty acids in the cell membrane, and are full of mitochondria in the in the the cytoplasm. You're going to have great skin, and and I think I think the the you know one month to six month wait. It's just too much for the people. They want a product they can buy, get it shipped overnight, put it on their skin, and their skin be better the next day. That's just not going to happen. Anytime you're buying into that model, you will be disappointed and you will waste money because that will never work. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I, I think about it like uh, it's like the lie of of the the serpent in uh, the Garden of Eden. You know, he said, you know, you're just you're only missing eating this apple kind of thing, right? Yeah. And it's really just a lie when really we got to look at what take inventory of our current lifestyle. That's what we have to do first and see where are we out of balance. And, you know, obviously looking at our nutrition is an easy thing because it's something we control. We control what we eat. We, it's hard to control what you breathe every day, but you yep. can definitely control what you eat and what you put in your body. And that's where we have to look. And that takes us really well into your book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. Um, and so let's talk about that. I mean, obviously you're, you're a physician practiced for 20 years. Uh, you were trained conventional medicine. And so, um, so you're, you're, you're a good person to write a book about lies, right? Because yeah. you were taught all this kind of stuff. So let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've always been a little bit of a contrarian and a bit of an iconoclast. And so going through medical school, I would hear things that professors would say, and I would be like, that don't make no sense, right? Because I'm also a country boy. And so things have to make mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. But then, you know, I would figure it out, oh, the biochemistry or this cycle. Okay, I see. Okay. But some things just didn't make sense at all. And, and I remember it, one of the very first things that just struck me dumb was when I was doing my uh, obstetrics rotation as a, an intern. We had been up all night on call delivering babies. And then the next morning, we would do circumcision on all the boy babies that the moms had signed the consent. And so, yeah, moms out there, if you're getting your baby circumcised at a teaching hospital, it's done by an intern or a second year resident who hasn't slept all night. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but but uh, so after the circs and everybody was fine, we would send the vaginal delivery babies home that day. And the chief resident said, don't for forget to write vitamin D drops for the exclusively breastfed babies. And I was, I, I'm an intern just out of med school. I'm like, why? He said, well, my, humans don't produce vitamin D in their breast milk. You have to do that or the baby will develop rickets. Hmm. I was like, okay, all right. So I wrote my prescriptions for the vitamin D drops and the mom's pain meds. And I, that just stuck with me. Like, how does that make any sense? How have we been on this planet for a quarter of a million years if we don't produce vitamin D in our breast milk? Because, you know, back yeah. 50,000 years ago, the baby was going to be exclusively breastfed for at least a right. year, if not longer. How did they, how are we, we should be extinct. That makes no sense. But I didn't question. I'd already learned early in my med school career to just keep your mouth shut, make a, put a mental check mark by that and check on it later. Never question your, your supervisor's <laughs> uh, intelligence. But and, and I want people to understand several things about this. First of all, my chief resident was brilliant, very smart guy. But what had just come out of his mouth, I, I would learn later, was ignorance, abject ignorance. But in all other appearances, he was a I mean, he was he was a moral, ethical gentleman, very intelligent, knew his stuff. But he was just wrong about that. And I, I learned later that there had actually been an excellent research study done in the Carolinas by a doctor that showed that if you'll give a mom 6,400 international units of vitamin D3 in her diet every day, or just let her get out in the sun yeah. every day and get enough UV radiation, human beings absolutely <laughs> produce vitamin D in their milk. And they produce right. it copiously and, and more than the baby would ever need. But if you've got a mom who's sitting inside all day, never getting any sun, and she never eats any vitamin D rich foods, then guess what? 
she doesn't produce any vitamin mm -hmm. D in her breast milk. But I want everybody to understand this, this gentleman who I looked up to, great respect still to this day, said the dumbest damn thing that 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 could be uttered that would be like saying oh humans can't uh, breathe air we have to give them a we have to send the babies home with an o2 tank so they can have oxygen because they they don't that's yeah right you see it's just it's it's just almost uh, brain breaking what how dumb what he said was but he had no idea that what he just said was idiotic because he was taught the same thing and indeed, if you keep a mom home and uh, shelter from the sun and don't give her vitamin D rich foods, her baby will develop rickets if, if it's exclusively breastfed because there's no vitamin D in this poor malnourished mother who never gets out in the sun. And that, that was the first lie. That, that And so the reason I call it a lie and not a, myth, a medical myth or something is because it's my job as a doctor to know what I'm talking about. And it was my chief resident's job. He should have, when he said that, he should have went, that don't make no sense, does it? I need to research that. that. That don't sound right. But he didn't do that. And that's a doctor's job is to constantly question every word that comes out of your mouth, but also out of the mouth of every other doctor you're around. And if we hear something that makes our spidey sense tingle, we should go, ah, I got to look into that. That doesn't make any sense. But doctors are human. And we, we, we get complacent and we get lazy. And once we've said something a thousand times, it's habit. And we don't even think about the truth of it any longer. Uh, and that's, that's inappropriate. And I think that, that it's, it, it's almost unforgivable. And that's why I've dedicated this second half of my career to try, try and undo all the damage that I did in the first few years of my medical practice when I would recommend to a diabetic, when I would give them the American Diabetes Association dietary guidelines, hand out and say, here, you need to eat this way. I harmed that patient. Hmm. When I, when I had somebody with hypertension and I didn't talk to them at all about lowering their carb intake, I would hand them the American Heart Association DASH diet. I harmed that person. Right. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to undo the damage I did early in my career when I was an ignorant idiot doctor who was, I was parroting what I was taught. And when you're, when you're practicing something as important as medicine, you don't get the luxury of just being a parrot and repeating what you've been taught. You don't get that luxury. You have a fiduciary relationship to your patients. They, they, there, there are ramifications if you give them bad advice or if you harm them in some way. And I think that's as it should be. It should be set up just like that. But doctors ha ha really have com become complacent because as you know, in reality, if you practice standard of care, and you practice by the guidelines, it's impossible to successfully come at you for, for harming a patient because you were, you were practicing according to community guidelines and, and standards of care. You're blameless in the eyes of the medical board and the, and the state, uh, you know, the state powers that be. Right. Absolutely not how it should be. Nobody practicing as a professional gets a pass. You don't get a pass mm -hmm. and say, oh, well, that's what the American Academy of what you might call it said. Therefore, who am I? I'm just, a, I'm just a doctor. The whole point of being called as a, as a physician and, and being trained as a physician and then being trusted as a physician means that your brain should be working 24-7. And many doctors, their, their brain's on idle. Yeah, and I've heard that it takes like 20 years before things are really well elucidated in the research before it starts to trickle into actual medical practice. Yep. At least. And so, yeah, I knew when I was going through chiropractic college, even the, the things I was learning there, because I was reading books on the side, and I realized everything I'm learning here is just vocabulary, and none of it's really practical. In fact, my nutrition teacher, and I'm in a, a natural health university, my nutrition teacher was like 350 pounds, yeah. and she had tried every single diet, right, struggled with all of it, and I had to literally lie on tests in order to pass tests to get through yep. school. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you were in a, you were at a university that kind of valued nutrition. Yeah. Right. I was at a state medical school and I remember my nutrition teacher very well. He was from New Zealand and he was a brittle diabetic. Now, brittle diabetic, they just thought that was a class of diabetes back then. We now know that if you take any diabetic and feed them 
enough carbohydrates, they'll become brittle, which means you can't control their blood sugar. Either They're either too high or too low all the time. And I can remember him bragging about how he would only eat whole wheat pasta. That's how he said he was from New mm. Zealand. He ate pasta. And I thought that was cute at the time. But what I didn't really understand was he was signing his own death warrant. He was literally harming himself every time he sat down and ate a plate of whole wheat pasta. And, and so, but that's who I learned nutrition science from was from a, a brittle diabetic who was promoting eating lots of pasta. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not, not a good spokesperson for, uh, no. for good health. No. Right. Right. Yeah. I remember, uh, I, I, I got a master's degree in exercise science as well while I was going through graduate school and my extra, I used to, so when I had irritable bowel, the thing that made me feel the best was intermittent fasting. So I was started fasting. Nobody, I didn't even know the term. Um, and I was fasting and I would work out in the mornings, fasted, and I would fast till like three o'clock in the afternoon. I felt amazing. Right. And then I would eat from like three to seven and I was able to gain back a lot of weight because I lost 30 pounds when I got irritable bowel. And so I would tell this to my exercise physiology teacher and she was like, oh no, it's absolutely crazy. You've got to drink, you know, like a pre-workout then you got to have the post-workout right afterwards. And it was just this constant feeding cycle. Otherwise, you're going to lose muscle. And, I, and for me, I, I was trying to tell her, well, I actually feel a lot better doing this. And I was trying to get some sort of like, a, you know, understand the physiology of what was happening. She could not understand it. Yep. yep. Yeah, Even though it, I was it, looking better and feeling better, she just yeah. could not understand it. Yeah. And that's, that's the pressure that uh, many healthcare providers feel regardless of what you see beneath you, and that would be your patients, because that's how most healthcare providers think, you're always looking above you for, for recommendations. And so when you see something in your practice that doesn't make any sense based on the recommendations coming down from on high, it's, it really is so incongruous that you're for a while, your mind can't accept it. And I can remember this happening to me when I started recommending a ketogenic diet to my patients, I was, I was using it just as a short-term weight loss hack for my most morbidly obese patients, right? They were, they were bound for bariatric surgery. And I'm like, Hey, why you, you know, why not just try this for three months? And uh, they would come back and they would say things like, Oh yeah, I've lost 45, whatever, 55 pounds, but my knee arthritis is so much better. And I would either chalk it up to the weight loss because of the mechanical right. stress, right? Yeah. But then I would have people who have thumb arthritis. This is a very common joint to have arthritis in. Their arthritis would be better. And unless they're hand walkers in the circus, that's not a weight-bearing joint. So why did that arthritis get better? And I would hear just all the time, my GERD's better. And I would think, well, they lost intra-abdominal fat, probably changed the pressure. I would hear, oh, my psoriasis is better. My eczema is better. My, my rosacea is better everything's better when I eat this way. Can I, so I've eaten keto for three months, lost 60 pounds. And also, you know, my shoulder arthritis is better. Can I do keto for another month or two? Is it safe? And I would say, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm researching it constantly. I haven't found anything bad about it. I think it's fine. But that was, you understand, even then yeah. with me knowing keto, I still was wary of it. Like, I don't yeah. know if this is safe to do long-term. But the more I did this, the more I read deeply into the literature, some of which has been uh, uh, hidden or just not yeah. published. I, I was like, actually, this is probably the way we should all eat all the time. And that's why I'm, over the last few months, I've actually come to refer to, to low carb, keto, ketovore, carnivore as the proper human diet, mm. because you remove the stigma of the K word, right? And then yeah. the craziness of the C word, but right. you're saying this is the proper human diet. Whenever you would like to return to good health and return to, to having an, uh, being close to your ideal body weight, you should stop eating that other diet and return to the proper human diet. And it's almost like you and I and other people in this space are what we're doing is rediscovering. Yeah. It's a rediscovery. Yeah. It's not a new discovery. It's not a fad. We're looking back into the genetics and epigenetics of the human mammal. We're looking back at our archaeology and paleoanthropology and we're saying, hey, actually, there is the proper human diet spectrum that we should all eat on. And what you're currently eating ain't that. And that's why you're obese or you're you're pre-diabetic or you have any of these chronic conditions is because in effect, what you're doing is slowly poisoning your biochemistry. That's what you're doing. And anytime you poison a mammal with any substance, 
that mammal will get sick. And in the case of carbohydrates, if you overdose that animal chronically on carbohydrates, they, they get fat, they have fat in inappropriate places like their liver and their pancreas and their tongue. Just uh, published a YouTube video about fatty tongue and its relation to mm -hmm. sleep apnea. It's actually yeah, a yeah, known right. thing. They've got MRIs of it. And one of the very first things that start to go away when you return to a proper human diet is the inappropriately stored fat in, in dangerous places like your liver, your pancreas, mm. your tongue. That's the first fat you burn off, almost as if your body is wise and intelligent. And it knows that I'm gonna get rid of the most dangerous fat first. And so that's what I think we're doing, you and I and everybody else, is we're rediscovering the proper human diet. And also when you call it what it is, it makes it harder for people to pretend it's a fad or pretend it's some kind of dangerous, yeah. weird diet. It's not that at all. We're just going back to eating the way we should have been eating this entire time. Yeah, that's a really good explanation. I like that proper human diet. And so what are, what are the considerations? Like when you're teaching people how to make this transition, what do you tell them? Like, okay, here, here they are, standard American diet. What should they do right now? Yeah, so step one for everybody is cut out all sugar, whether added or natural. And the reason I make that step one is because I think it's the most important, but also I think that most people can get on board with that because there, there's very few people out there who say, oh, sugar's completely safe. Sugar is not the devil. Most people know sugar is bad for your teeth. It's bad for all the rest of your body. So most people can get on board with that. Then step two is to cut out all grains. And, and, and so a lot of people want to have the modern GMO wheat versus emmer wheat versus einkorn wheat argument. And I think that emmer wheat and einkorn wheat are less bad than modern GMO wheat, but I, that doesn't make them good. And so I find that people without exception do better when they just get all grains out of their diet. Grains are a starvation food. And they will definitely keep you from starving. But if what you're interested in is returning to good health and optimizing your health, grains play no part in that. No grain, including quinoa, millet, rye, amaranth. I'm sorry. All of those are starvation foods. Then step three is to remove all vegetable oils from your diet. Without exception, there is no healthy vegetable oil. Even cold-pressed canola oil or rapeseed oil still has way too many omega-6 fatty acids uh, compared to the omega-3 fatty acids. Inflammatory is going to cause you problems. And then step four is to come to grips, to, to come back to meat. Fatty meat, mm -hmm. whether it's from the ocean, whether it's from the pasture, or whether it's from the hen house, fatty meat is an ancestral food for human beings. There is no healthy diet that doesn't include fatty animal products. I'm sorry that you just mm -hmm. cannot reach your penultimate health without having some fatty animal foods in your diet. And, and after that, then they, they can start learning, watching YouTube videos, uh, reading blogs, and then they, then they can figure out the minutia. What I'm trying to do is get people started yeah. on the right direction. And once they're on the right direction, then they can have the argument about, well, what about the carbs from sweet potatoes versus wheat. I mean, I don't know which one's better. What about honey? What about fruit? You know, and everybody, I, I think everybody should have those debates and those discussions, but with, there should be a, a foundational level of principles that you understand that you're not going to violate. And I think those yeah. are the first four principles. And when you got those under your belt, I, I, I think right now, if you and I could become co-dictators of the United States and we said, okay, guys, this is the new law. If you break this law, you, it's the death penalty. Here's the first four laws. And it were those four laws. The incidence of, of type two diabetes would disappear. Yeah. It would go away. There would not be, I mean, there'd be one person out of 250,000 who had type two diabetes because they were still eating too, too much, uh, you know, uh, sweet potatoes and kale and they're getting too <laughs> much carbohydrates, but 99% of the population that's currently type two diabetic, it would disappear. Fatty yeah. liver would cease to exist if law five was stop drinking alcohol. We'd have to put that in there yeah. too. There would be no such thing as fatty liver. It would not exist in the human animal, right? And yeah. of course, we don't want to be dictators. We just want to teach people these things and have them say, my health is important enough. My family's health is important enough. My offspring's health is important enough that I want to make the, this, these four things foundational principles in my diet for the rest of my life. And I also want to pass this 
valuable knowledge along to my offspring so that then they can, yeah. for generations to come, my family line will be healthier than it would have been otherwise. Yeah, I mean, if, if that were to be the case, we would definitely empty out the hospitals, you know, yeah. people would just be so much healthier, right. you know, hospitals would be there for for what they're supposed to be there for trauma emergency care, you know what I mean? And, and there would be uh, so many endocrinologists, so yeah. many cardiologists, so many neurologists looking for work, because right. they would show up to work every day and they'd have one patient all day, because nobody would would need their right. specialized medicines and infusions and, and procedures because you don't need knee replacements at nearly the same rate for bone on bone, my knees worn out, or you know, arthritis for years. You wouldn't need that because that knee wouldn't wear out if you were feeding it a proper human diet. You wouldn't have the type 2 diabetics and people in liver failure because they had chronically fatty, fatty liver from their diet. That Those things just would no longer happen. And so you would literally have endocrinologists working part-time at Walmart trying to pay their their Lexus payment because they're not seeing patients anymore. Yeah, it would completely shift the economy. And that's another thing people need to consider is that, you know, the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry really have built-in incentives and in you continuing to buy their products and they're going to market hard and they're also going to invest into their own scientific research, right? To, uh, yeah. to keep you using their products. It's human nature, and if there's you, you know, we like to paint them as evil, and paint mm -hmm. the whole thing as a conspiracy. But that's not what it is. It's just human nature. Yeah. Remember what I said earlier about the doctor who's seeing this weird result in their patient, but then they're listening to their medical board from above, and their, and the, yeah. you know, the regulatory bodies. That's a very, very uncomfortable position to be in. People at Kellogg's and Post and Quaker, they're in the same position. Many yeah. of those guys, and actually I, I read an interview by a former CEO of Kellogg's, he, he completely is low carb because he now he knows that was wrong. But when yeah. he was in his CEO role, it was he had a fiduciary relationship to his yeah. shareholders. He had to make Kellogg's money or not only get fired, but face federal laws. Yeah. That's his job. That was his literal legal job was to make profits for Kellogg's. But he didn't eat that way. His family didn't eat that way. And he sure doesn't eat that way now. And so people have to realize it's not really a conspiracy. These guys are all just doing their job. They're a cog yeah. in the wheel. And what we got to do is, is we got to throw monkey wrenches in all the gears. And, and, and I try to do this every day on Twitter, Instagram, Parler, uh, uh, TikTok. Hey, I'm everywhere trying to <laughs> reach people and say, hey, that's probably not what you should be eating. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Absolutely. So what are the biggest mistakes you see people make when they go low carb or ketogenic diet? Yeah. Well, probably the biggest mistake is they come to uh, the proper human diet with their preconceived Western thought notion that I have a problem. Therefore I need to buy things hmm. to fix my problem. And so these are the people very often will come in and they're buying all the keto cake mixes, all the keto bars, the keto shakes, the, the exogenous ketones are buying all mm -hmm. this stuff thinking that's mandatory to do keto right. <laughs> and, and that's absolutely false. And what you're going to wind up doing is eating too much processed food and you're going to wind up because all the keto processors out there, they want to talk about net carbs, don't they? Yeah. They yeah. have to talk about net carbs because if they talk about total carbs, their food's no longer a keto food. And so they try to trick you playing the net carb game. And so these people, they're, they're eating 150 grams total a day of keto approved carbohydrates because they're counting net carbs and not total carbs. And that these are also the people that walk away from keto three months or six months later saying keto don't work or keto doesn't work for me or I don't know, my, my metabolism must, must just be broken. Keto didn't work for me. Well, no, you weren't actually eating a, a proper human keto diet. You were eating all these cakes and pies and cookies and shakes and bars. That's not keto. Keto is real, whole, one ingredient food that either was grown in the dirt or ate things that was grown in the dirt. And the more I do this, the more I think we really should focus on eating things that ate things that grew from the dirt. That's really what mm. the proper human diet should consist mostly of is animal foods. And if you were, if you were, you know, if your pantry was full of all these keto products and exogenous ketones, you actually weren't doing keto at all. You were just doing some other fad diet. 
Yeah, for sure. I, I would say with exogenous ketones, they can be good for kind of the initial keto adaptation, kind of teaching the body to use ketones. But once you get keto adapted, you really don't need them. Maybe if you're like a high extreme athlete, right? Something like that. It's a lot better than drinking like uh, you know, a power gel or something like that. If you're, you know, doing a, a triathlon, but in general, yeah, people don't, don't need stuff like that. Really. It's right. just dialing in the right diet. So you're right on target with that. Now, what does your typical diet look like? Are you doing intermittent fasting? How many meals a day are you eating? What does that typically yeah. look like for you? Do you have kind of like a, a set schedule or is it just change and vary by the day? It's, it's pretty much a set schedule unless we have a family or a social event. Uh, intermittent fasting has become just a, a, an effortless, thoughtless daily thing for me. And so every single day, unless there's some big family of breakfast, I'll fast anywhere from 18 to 22 hours every single day. It's mm -hmm. just, it, I don't even think about it anymore. Uh, the last time I had breakfast was at last Christmas because there's, you know, this part yeah. of the family that always has their traditional family breakfast. So I had bacon and eggs and that made everybody happy. And it was <laughs> one day out of the year. So not that big a deal. Uh, but so when I do break my fast, usually somewhere between uh, 1 p.m. and 5 p.m., it's just 99 percent meat or eggs. Yeah. butter. It's that I'm, I'm almost exclusively carnivore now because for my DNA, which I talked about earlier, yeah. it seems like I have to be as close to a carnivore as I can if I want to feel like this and look like this and perform like this on a daily basis, never get sick, never have any kind of aches and pains. Uh, you know, I, I'm 51 now and I go out with my chainsaw and I can, I can outdo any of the young bucks out there on the farm. And they're like, man, why do you do that? I'm like, you need to eat more meat, my friend. And because th that's what my DNA seems to thrive on. Uh, sometimes I'll have some cheese, but I've kind of found out that cheese needs to be an occasional treat for me. Yeah. It needs to be a dessert because even full fat, real fermented cheese is just too inflammatory for me. I'll start to, I'll start to retain fluid. I'll start to have little joint tweaks. Uh, and, and this, uh, also, that it falls perfectly in with that model I was talking about earlier of what did we eat for the longest period of time? Because we've only been having any kind of cheese in our diet for the last two to 4,000 years. It was just unheard of before that. Mm -hmm. and, and so I do drink coffee, but I readily admit that that, that is weird. Either coffee is the one modern thing that's okay uh, because I don't seem to react to it, but we've only been drinking coffee for a few hundred yeah. years. I mean, it's very, very recent in the, the archaeological record when we started you know, harvesting coffee beans and making coffee out of them, but it doesn't seem to bother me. And so I think people should really have two litmus tests. First of all, what have humans done for a long damn time? Yeah. And when I say a long time, I don't mean the last 50 years. I don't even mean the last, uh, I, I don't even want to talk about it until we're further back than 15,000 years. Because between 10 and 15,000 years ago, we had the agriculture revolution, right? And, and, and during which when we started to eat lots of grains and legumes, our brain actually shrunk, our dental health went in the shitter, our bone health, we started to develop osteoporosis and all kinds of, of evidence we see in the fossil record of our bones just going to crap. We just started to, you know, we got shorter. All these things happened during the agricultural revolution and none of those things sound good to me. And yeah. so I want to talk about what did we do 15,000 years ago or further back? That's the, that's the part of human's history on this planet I want to talk about. And when you go back that far, you immediately find that we ate as much fatty meat as we could get our hands on. If we were starving, damn right, we would eat some plants, 100%. But if we had as much fatty meat as we wanted, as much bone marrow, as much brain, as much organ meat, then we would use plants for two things, either medicinal or spices. And that was it with that. We just had, we didn't need the plants. We didn't want the plants. We wanted the, the fattiest animal in the herd. That's the one we wanted to bring back to our tribe because that's what gives optimal human health. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And what, what would be your top five foods? If you can only live on five <laughs> foods, what would they be? Gosh, uh, it would be, uh, it would be ribeye. It would be ground beef. It would be cod liver, which I love for some reason. It, it, it would definitely be maybe several types of liver. If I could make those all one of my five choices. So chicken liver, yeah. beef liver, cod liver, uh, ribeye, minced beef. Um, gosh, what else? Lamb. Got to have some lamb mm. in there. And then I guess number five would just be various 
plant spices so I could spice yeah. up those delicious cuts of meat, flavor. Make, them, make them even more succulent. But there's, there's literally, if I had to pick five things, plants would not be in there because, and people say, well, what about your magical phytonutrients? What about all the vitamins and minerals you're missing by not eating the plants? And I love it when people ask me that question because it's a learning opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. And I could tell them my barn story. If I took you and locked you in my barn, and did not let you out for 50 years. And I gave you cheap ground beef and beef liver. And that's literally all you could eat for the next 50 years. How many vitamin and mineral deficiencies would you develop? And they're like, oh gosh, a bunch, I'm sure. And I'm like, well, think about it and get back to me and tell me. And they never get back to me because once they look up the nutrition facts of meat and uh, organ meats, they're like, it's all in there. I'm not going to be deficient in anything. But if I took that same person and locked them up for 50 years in my barn and they could only eat plants and let's add, let's make, let's sweeten the deal. They could order plants from anywhere in the world. So they could get goji berries from the Jamaican mountains. They could get this herb from the Himalayas and, and they could, but they could only eat plants. How many vitamin and mineral deficiencies would you develop in the 50 years time? quickly they get my point oh a list i would have to have a list of supplements or i would die in just a few years in your barn i'm like there you go now you understand the superfood power of animal foods and absolutely if, if an animal is treated properly and fed properly and pastured and and eats a species appropriate diet they're going to be even more healthy there's no doubt about that but many of my listeners have a job and they have bills to pay and they can't afford $22 a pound ribeye that's grass fed, grass finished and panda massaged. Right. And so they all they can do is buy the, the best meat that they can get their hands on. And you absolutely can improve your health doing that. Always buy the best quality you can afford. But if you can't afford, you know, $22 a pound ribeye, then don't waste your, don't, don't go bankrupt trying to buy that just to eat the cheap ground beef because that's what I've done for years and I still eat the cheap beef and it, it does not seem to have any effect on me uh, but I think people should eat the best quality animal food that they they can and I think they should eat uh, meat that comes from well-treated am animals and like Joel Salton says let the chicken be a chicken let the cow be a cow yeah that's very important yeah, so true. And, and what most people don't realize too is when you keep your insulin under control, your need for extra antioxidants goes down. Yep. So when your insulin's all over the place, you're creating a tremendous amount of oxidative stress, yep. all the advanced glyco glycation end products and uh, just all the, the, the damage that high blood sugar, high insulin does, you need more antioxidants to help protect. And when you keep your insulin levels real stable, you have a significantly lower need for a lot of those things. And that's and your body. Reason. Your body actually makes its own antioxidants. Yeah, it does. More of those when you eat a proper human diet. And yeah. the number one complaint I get about carnivores, where's my vitamin C coming from? And it looks like there's ample, because it looks like humans don't make vitamin C. We're missing mm -hmm. a key enzyme. And early in this process, I had a hypothesis that maybe eating a low enough carbohydrate diet kick back on the production of that enzyme. And so we were maybe start like most other mammals, we were making our own vitamin C again, but it looks like that's not true. It looks like that when you're eating a high carb diet, it's going to spike your blood sugar and vitamin C and, and glucose, they kind of use the same yeah. little gate to get inside your cells. And so when you're eating a high carb diet, you probably need to take a vitamin C supplement, but when you're eating a very low carbohydrate diet, and the second uh, thing that breaks people's minds is there's vitamin C in fresh meat and there's lots of vitamin C in organ meat. Yeah. And so when you, that's why my guy's not going to die of scurvy in the barn because he's getting vitamin C, number one. And then number two, he doesn't need to ingest as much vitamin C because as you alluded to, he's not as inflamed. He doesn't need as much vitamin C. His body's making more of the other, other antioxidants that our body makes naturally when you feed us properly. And then he's also not eating a high carbohydrate diet. So the vitamin C is not having to compete for the receptor to get into the cell to do its job. 
Yeah, so good. I mean, this has been a great interview. We could talk for hours just about all these things. But uh, Dr. Barry, this has been fantastic. Guys, his book is Lies, My Doctor Told Me. We'll link it in the show notes. Definitely check it out. It's, uh, it's simple to read and you will learn a lot, just things that you can be doing, a lot of things that we talked about and uh, breaking through just a lot of medical myths that are out there that, uh, that you've probably been told. And also a great book to pass on to your doctor as well. Uh, because he's he's been told those doctors too. Yeah, that's right. Any last words of inspiration for us? Yeah, for everybody out there, thanks so much for giving me this opportunity. Just remember your health, your skin, the rest of your body and your brain are absolutely built of what you've eaten over the last few months. If you're not happy with your current health, change your diet and things will get better. Well, there you have it. Great interview today. Guys, go out and start taking action. We'll see you on a future podcast. Be blessed, everybody.